said, uh, I'm the co-founder of Convivo. Convivo is an online grocery delivery service. Uh, we launched about a year ago in beta and now we're moving to London for expansion. And I'm also uh, lecturing at the Warwick Manufacturing Group, which is the uh, only master's degree uh, department at the uh, University of Warwick uh, in a master's called Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And today we're going to talk about how to value business ideas. Um, this session, uh, I, I did my best to shrink it into 20 minutes because it's actually like a whole day uh, session uh, that we do at Warwick. So I hope I did a good job on this. Um, here are the sources uh, from that most of the things you're gonna that we're gonna talk about uh, found them from, and I have many more sources if I want if you want me to give you uh, afterwards. So before we begin, uh, I'd like to tell you that I'm not an expert on this, and in fact, no one is an expert. If there was a, a systematic and proven way on how to value the ideas, everyone would do it, and everyone would be filthy rich. But it's not like this. So what I've done is just gathered some really good sources and in general I co-founded a startup. I'm uh, really uh, enthusiastic about startups and I'm excited to share the ideas and whatever I have, uh, what knowledge I have with you. So yeah, you can find me. I have my email there and my Twitter account. You can find me there. So. Uh, before we begin, I want to talk about something that many people uh, have a wrong perception. They always focus on the product before they even have a product. And in reality, product is great and it's really important, but it's actually the many other things that you need to focus instead of the product, at least in the beginning. And these are many things I'm going to talk about here today, but most importantly is your users, right? The product might be great, you might have built an amazing product with these great features, but nobody really gives a shit because they don't want to use it. They want other things. So this is uh, a distinction between you know building a great company, building a product, and how to evaluate it. Product comes second, maybe third, maybe later on. The idea comes in the beginning, and we're going to talk about this today. Uh, and again, another thing that we always uh, say, and I really like this, uh, is that it's not about the product, right? It's about what the product will do for you, will do for the customer. So when, when a customer goes to a restaurant to eat, it's not the food that they, they care about, it's how to satisfy their hunger. So if you go to Starbucks, and Starbucks are really good in marketing, this is the environment, is your friends that you're gonna gather. It's not about the coffee itself. So when you're building a product, when you're, when you're selling a product, it's not about the product itself, it's what the product will do for your customer. So I'm going to start with a quote. Uh, this is a quote from Y Combinator. If you're not familiar, Y Combinator is a seed stage uh, investment company in Silicon Valley, probably the biggest one in the world. Uh, Dropbox and Airbnb are one of the biggest companies they've invested in early stage. And this is something that they have, it's like a motto they have, and it become maybe a norm in the couple, last couple of years, but it's really interesting to, when you build something, build something customers want, right? So it might sound, <coughs> easy to grasp and okay very common yeah we'll do it but many people really forget this to build something they that customers actually really care about and how do we do this right so it might be that you're building a startup and it's obvious that there is a need for what you're building uh, an example that i have here so we can relate as greeks let's say uh, it's easyjet uh, so when easyjet launched uh, about i don't know 15 20 years ago, uh, it was clear that there was a need for cheaper transportation, right? No one could argue that, no, if you're going to build a service, uh, uh, an airline company that is going to be cheaper to travel from London to Greece, I'm not going to use it. Everyone would use it. It was really obvious. But there are other examples, like one of my favorite examples, which is the ATM. Like, I don't know, I wasn't <coughs> there when they started in like 50s or 60s, but I bet that when they first introduced the ATM, people will be reluctant to go on a wall, at a, to a machine attached on a wall and do money transactions. It was something really new for them. But I bet now we cannot really imagine ourselves without the ATM. So it might be obvious that there is a need for what we're building, but it might be completely the other way around. And you cannot even ask customers because they have no idea what you're talking about and if they will like it or not. Um, in terms of what we ask customers, 
what Paul Graham says in what one of the one of the founders of Y Combinator in a lecture that he had about generating ideas and evaluate them is that don't ask, ask customers what they want, but ask them what problems are they facing. Usually, if you have an idea, the first thing you're gonna do is ask your friends and your family what they think, right? And of course, they're gonna say it's great because they love you, so they're not gonna say anything different. If you go and ask. Uh, I don't know, 3,000 people, you might get a better uh, grasp of what is real and what's not. But again, people can lie, you have no idea if this is true. Again, you might come up with the wrong results. So, however, by, by asking them what problems they have, regardless of what your idea is, and then you go and build something to solve their problem, it's better. So, if I have an idea, even if I have it and I have it in my back of in my back of my head for I don't know money transactions, uh, payment transactions, everything, I would ask you know customers what problems are they facing in today's uh, money transaction apps, uh, websites, uh, and uh, other services with their banks. If I can relate these problems to my product, it will be better. I will probably build something that is closer to what my users want. Um, <coughs> here is something really interesting. You have two options basically, either to build something that few people want but in a large amount or build something that many people want in a small amount. The result more or less is the same even though this graph is really shit. Uh, but what you can see here, you can imagine it's a circle that's very narrow and deep and this is like a, a very large width but not really uh, deep. So. Which one do you think it's best? So let's say I have an idea. Is it better to target few people that actually really, really want your product or many people that just, you know, it's okay, they're gonna use it probably. Few people. A few many people, people, okay? Many people. Many people, all right. Okay, really quick, why and why? I think because the few people are very interested in what I'm selling, the other ones are medium, kind of, and they're not. I said that because we had a conversation. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and you had the oh, who had who said <laughs> many? Said ah sorry, many okay. People. Can you can you say why? Well then then you depend on the few clientele that have <coughs> your product if you adopt strategy. If you adopt that strategy, whereas if you adopt this strategy. So, so here if you adopt this strategy, because many people are using it, you're probably right. And instead of that, because m some people might want it, but it, all the rest might want something completely different, right? Okay. So, um, I'm more in the favor of this one. Uh, there's no right and wrong. Uh, again, what many people that are very knowledgeable about this, they say that few in a large amount is better when you start. And the reason is this. When you start something, you don't really know what you need to build, right? If you build something that many people use but in a small amount, you're not really targeting a problem that they have, so you don't know exactly what is it that you're building. If you focus really a few customers and be narrow and deep, you're gonna learn so much more, and when you start a startup, what you need is people to want to, to go crazy over your product. This goes in line to when you're building the product, we're gonna talk about it afterwards, and it's very important when you're building the product, in order to tailor it to have the maximum result, you need to have people who are urgently need your product. If they don't care, you would lose your impact on what am I building and what problem am I solving. <coughs> We're gonna talk about a little bit more of this. But basically what you need is this. So what you need is, you start explaining the product, but they need it so much that they're gonna say, shut up and take my money. Like, I don't want to hear anything else. It's great, it's gonna solve my problem. Even if it's not great, I'm gonna buy it. But if I don't need it a lot, probably it's gonna be a freemium model that many people will use, but nobody will give a shit to, to pay for it. If it's something they urgently want and they really want it, they're gonna pay for it. So, second thing is to evaluate the market you are entering. Uh, that's very important and it's always better to be in a growing market. Um, it's totally different than growing economy because many people are confusing this. So, so maybe Greece is not a growing economy but there are growing markets within that declining economy. So 
again, there are, there are options to target something small in a rapidly growing market or something really big in a slow growing market. Um, in general, your chances to succeed are better in a growing market. And I forgot to mention this when I, when I started the presentation, but you might do all these things and your product will never sell. You might do completely the opposite and you're going to be successful. There's no guidance on, on you know, something that you have to follow and you're going to be successful. So there are always options. This is just to save time, probably money, and if it doesn't work, you go to something else. Uh, is your market big enough? This is a very interesting company called Webvan. I'm quite sure nobody has heard of it. Anyone has heard of Webvan? Okay, so Webvan, 15 years ago, uh, they started with, it was an online grocery delivery service, like what we are doing with Convivo today. Um, so what they did is that, so, because maybe you're not familiar with online grocery, so in the UK, for example, which is the, the biggest market in, in online grocery, you can order your groceries online from only one store, you have delivery on the next day, you have to wait at home for a couple of hours uh, to, to get the delivery, you pay delivery fees, you have minimum order requirements and all of this. Webvan, 15 years ago, when the internet was only broadband internet at that point, so really slow, they were very great on what they're doing. They were, they were having uh, automated warehouses, so they didn't have any retail stores, everything was automated. Um, they were delivering, they were saying that they're going to deliver in 20 minutes, so not same day that nobody's doing in the UK today, but 20 minutes, 30 minutes delivery, which was great by that time. And they got a lot of investments, as you can see, 800 million in investments. They had a lot of revenue, 77 million in the first quarter. Until today, they were like the fastest IPO in startup history, so they entered the stock exchange market in almost $8 billion uh, valuation. But after a few months, they went bankrupt with losses of 830 million. Uh, many things I've written about why Webfund failed. The most important thing is that the market wasn't big enough. The time was wrong. The internet was slow. Not many people were ordering online. Might as well order groceries online. So even though they had 77 million with the investment they did, they probably needed three times, four times this amount to make it happen. So evaluating the market. Is the market ready? Is the market big enough to what you're doing? It might not be big enough, but, it's, but it might be a growing market. So what you do is adapt. So don't spend 200 million in automated warehouses. Start it maybe in a more like a simple way in order to grow the market. It's very <laughs> interesting the story about Webvan. I suggest you just Google it and you read many things. Um, one thing you you have to consider again. So all this time I wasn't using it. Okay, uh, is uh, how big. Uh, your idea of the market could be. So can you imagine in 10 years what's going to happen in the market that you are entering or how big your company can be in 10 years? This is a quote from Airbnb. It was, uh, I got it from uh, the emails that they exchanged from the early investors. They, they put them online uh, like last year, I think. And one of the quotes they said in the email trying to convince investors, they said, our long-term goal is to be in the market leaders in accommodation the way it is in stuff. So Airbnb started really, really small, but they had this vision. They wanted to be the leaders in accommodation, and they did it. So it's good to know where we're heading uh, in terms of the market and in terms of our idea. Another thing which is good to, to consider is competition. Um, many people will say, and, and I agree to, to a certain extent, that don't care about the competition. Just build your products. If you have users that love your product, don't care about what the others are doing. And it's true in a, in a sense. Uh, but you also, before you start your business, you want to be quite different than the others, right? So don't just copy an idea, change a little bit of features and, and change the name and launch, but try to be different. So do a thorough evaluation of what the competition are doing, what are they offering, what customers say about this, what problems are they facing, and if you can solve the problems that the competition is not solving, you're in a good track. Uh, but I think you have to do some research on the competition, it's always good. Um, another thing is how capable are you? Um, and how, you know, building the perfect team. This is uh, Google Founders. Uh, what I've experienced and what I've read about other startups, 
it's that it's a very hard task, all right? It's very, very demanding. So if you're alone, even if you have all the capabilities, so you know how to program, you know how to sell, you know how to do marketing, you, you know everything, you're just not going to have the time to do it. So are you capable of delivering it? Or if you're not, are you capable of, of, of structuring a team around it to deliver this proposition? So this is very important. The, the most important thing I had from, uh, let's say, from, from my experience like three years now building a startup is that I'm so fortunate that I found two founders that we get along, we have complementary skills and we can build this uh, product. Uh, that's the most important thing. And single founders are not really attractive for investors as well. Some might invest, but the, the perfect number is between, or the most common number, let's say, that got funding is three to four founders. Uh, just because it's, it, it's a lot of things to do, right? So you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. If you hire people to do it, you cannot rely at least on, on early stage to, to employees. And you're not going to have the money to hire them anyway. That might sound a little bit silly and really uh, theory, I have to have passion. Yeah, don't say you have passion, show it. But it actually goes back to the last thing I said, that how hard it is. And if you don't really believe, love what you're doing, you're just going to give up. This is a quote from Steve Jobs in an interview they had with uh, Bill Gates on stage. And they asked, like, what's the most important thing? And he said, the most important thing, the first most important thing is to have passion about your idea just because it's so hard that you're going to give up. And, and trust me, you have this feeling every single day because every single day something is going wrong. Nothing is easy. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And that's probably like the road that everyone thinks that all the startups, because we read, like, we read all the, the nice stuff. Like, yeah, they built this company, they raised 50 million, they sold it after three years. Oh, well, it's easy, let's do it as well. That's just like a tiny, I don't know, zero point something percent of the startups that start, most of them fail. And most of them have this path. Now, if you're great, if you build a great team, if you are lucky, if you're on time, if you do everything right, you might have this path. Uh, I certainly don't think that's easy and you shouldn't target this. You should target this and be ready for it. So building a great team and being passionate about what you're building probably will get you through the way. Otherwise, you're going to quit in like 200 different stages from this path. So when you, when you want to build something, uh, one thing you need to consider is the effort you, you need to put into what you want to build. What do I mean by effort? And I, I have this picture of Lean Startup, which is a really nice book. I suggest everyone to read it if you haven't already. It's a Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Uh, so how quick can you launch? If it takes you three years to build the first product, it's probably a long time. You need to build it within a few months, even if it's a crappy version build it, get it out there and see the reaction of customers. Um, can you do it without any investment or at least with a little bit of investment or your own money or friends and family, this common thing that everyone says, uh, which I don't believe by the way, uh, but can you do it without money? Can you do it with your own capability? It goes back to the capability, like are you capable, you and your team, to build something, get some customers and then the rest will follow if it's a good product. But can you do it fast and can you do it without money? How long will you take? How long will it take to have product, product market fit? So you launch the product. What happens? How the market reacts? Because something that you cannot predict is the market. You can predict from almost everything, but the market you cannot change it. You cannot predict it. Yes. Ah, oh, two minutes. Okay. Uh, five. Ah, oh, five. Great. All right. Um, so, so how much effort do you need to put in to build the first version of your product? All these companies have started exactly like this, with minimum effort, only their own capability, until they were at the stage where they said, okay, we need to grow, we need to raise some money in order to go quicker, better, and everything. Read this book, it's absolutely amazing. Um, so, let's say we've evaluated in theory, we tested the market, we are capable, we are passionate, it's a growing market, we know that customers want it for the reason that we ask them or whatever. Um, Let's build it, right? That's the next step, which is very, very important. And one term that you might, might be familiar with it or not is the MVP, the Minimum Viable Product. 
So the minimum viable product is the maximum result that you can have with a minimum effort. So can you build something with a minimum effort but get some customers? And this is the, the loop that they, they explain in the book, which is like you build something, you expose it to the customers, you measure your, their reactions, you learn from their reactions and from their feedback, and you do whatever it has to, you do, do whatever you need to do to change it according to customers' feedback, and you build a second version. You go again this loop. You measure it again, you learn from it, you build it again. This might go a hundred different times. And the, inter the interesting thing is that every time you do it, this is an experiment, but every experiment is a different product. Because every time you're going to build something and you're going to learn from what you've built and you're going to add these features or remove these features, it's a different product. This might happen a lot in the beginning, probably not a lot if you start growing, but in the beginning is really important. I had a discussion with uh, Corinna. Yeah. yeah, Corinna earlier. So she wants to start a startup, right? And she's so eager to like build the product and how am I going to do it? And this uh, might like it, they might not like it. You don't know what they like or what they don't. So build something really simple and your customers will tell you if they like it or not. And then you're going to build it around your customers' needs, right? It's much easier and you're going to spend less time and money, I believe. Even if, you, if, you, if your idea is small in the beginning, it's not bad. So even uh, you think big, you better start small. <coughs> Basically, startups uh, don't have money in the beginning. So you cannot build something huge. You cannot compete with the big companies. What you can do is build something small and have a vision of where it needs to go. One thing you can compete is absolutely fucking amazing customer service and customer experience. Big, big companies cannot do that. They mess with it all the time, but you can. Because you're small, you can have your early adopters, you can ask them what the problems they have and go and build it for them. And your early adopters will be the luckiest people on earth because you're gonna over deliver to them. That's, what you, that's your asset when you start a business, right? You have the time to do customer service. You, you, you have the capability of being on top of your customers and know exactly what they want. Something that big companies cannot do. This is a quote from Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. If you're not embarrassed with your first version of your product, you launch too late. <laughs> I don't need to say anything else. Um, this is for, from Bill Gross. It's, it was a tech, tech talk. And it summarized that basically these are the things that are most important uh, when you start a company. So funding is last. Most important based on their research is timing, then it's team, then it's the idea, the business model, and the funding. It's a, it's a nice TED talk. I just put it there uh, just for your information. And so I, we have about less than a minute. So for the last 19 minutes, I've been talking about how to generate, no, how to generate idea, not so much, but how to evaluate your idea. But I'm sorry to say that this is the truth. So ideas alone are absolutely worthless. Everyone has ideas. I bet everyone has in the room ideas, and one of these ideas or ten of these ideas might become the best, the next best thing. But what matters most is the implementation. So yes, you have a great idea, great. Start building it and try to be best in the implementation because that what will distinguish you from your competitor. The idea itself really doesn't worth anything. And this is a quote from Sam Altman, the president of Y Combinator. Uh, and based on his, uh, his data, a great execution is at least 10 times as important and 100 times harder than a great idea. I completely agree.